tell us about you. Yeah, definitely. Great, great to to be chatting with you today, Neil. Um, a little bit about me. So I'm Mark Catalano. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, TakeShape. Uh, and at TakeShape, we build a thing that we call an API mesh, which uh, has a goal of helping front-end developers be able to combine and make sense of all of the different APIs that make up their Jamstack and headless applications. So we help them take any GraphQL or any REST API uh, and combine that, do, uh, combine that into a single GraphQL API that they can use in their applications, whether it's on the front-end in a static site generator or in a serverless function. That's great. Um, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about why did you start TakeShape? Yeah, so we we started TakeShape. So I actually started TakeShape with my with my co-founder, Andrew, uh, and our CTO at, at TakeShape uh, back in 2018. But the ideas behind TakeShape actually started a long time before that. Uh, so I, I had been running a design and engineering shop in Brooklyn. Uh, for about eight years. And in early, you know, 2011, we were really early adopters of things like Jekyll. Uh, and so we were getting really into building with static site generators and building headless experiences and using serverless functions. Once that launched uh, in like 2015, we were really early adopters of GraphQL. Um, and so we saw all of these different pieces of technology kind of coming together. Uh, and what they could enable us to do at the agency was really use a lot more front-end resources uh, and a lot less back-end resources to build the kinds of websites and applications we were creating for our, our, our clients. Um, at the time, uh, we, when we actually started, like the crucible of the idea of, of TakeShape was inside that agency. And at the time, really only Contentful was one of the only real headless um, CMS options out there. And we actually started Take Shape originally as a, as a project inside the agency with the idea that we would build a headless uh, GraphQL based CMS. So at the time, you know, Contentful existed. They didn't have a GraphQL API at the time. Um, there weren't really a lot of, there weren't really any other GraphQL, there wasn't really another GraphQL based headless CMS out there. And, um, and we decided we would build something internally as an, as an internal project. And that internal project eventually became TakeShape, which we launched in late 2018 publicly. Um, and then we spent about a year with uh, running TakeShape essentially as a headless content management system product um, and spent a lot of time with the Jamstack community and the headless community listening to what they needed and listening to where uh, what kind of problems they were encountering. And we were trying to kind of look ahead as to what was going to come next in the world of headless and what was going to be start to become an issue. And that's when we realized that one of the problems that we had encountered at the agency was going to start to be much more relevant in the broader world of Jamstack. And that had to do with kind of the growing number of APIs that you use to build your applications and being able to integrate those on the front end and in static site generators. Um, and so we, we decided to take the focus of the product and move from thinking about the product as a headless CMS platform to try to solve this API uh, organization problem that, that we saw. Um, so we were able to be inspired by things like, um, like schema stitching and, and uh, graph, just the, the general principles of GraphQL that we, that we saw that were really powerful for front end developers. Um, and decided to apply that to not just GraphQL APIs, but GraphQL APIs, REST APIs, and really anything that we could pull into, uh, you know, what we now refer to as an API mesh. That's great. I think I have two follow-up questions on that. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing you mentioned about the, the overhead of these technologies, um, serverless, Jamstack, headless, it brings a overhead to front-end developers. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about like uh, how does it influence the developer experience for the front end developers? These technology or kind of a trends? What do you see as yeah. a Jamstack headless? Um, yeah, so we see I see Jamstack and headless as really being uh, an, an empower like, like an empowerment tool for a front end developer. Um, I think Chris Coyer put this really well at the first Jamstack conference where, you know, he talked about giving front end developers superpowers and how the Jamstack and, and Headless are really um, well positioned to do that. 
And it is really an amazing thing when you can, when as a front end developer, you can kind of dive in to a project and really execute most of a project, if not all of a project on your own without having to, uh, to necessarily collaborate with backend developers. I think everybody, maybe not everybody remembers this time, but there was a time in my career where I remember there was always, there's always like a really clear handoff and collaboration point between front end developers and backend developers. Um, and when you would hand off, uh, when you would do the handoff and how you would manage that and whether you were building templates uh, on a, on a dynamically gen rendering system like a WordPress or whether you were building more of a dynamic front end application and then making uh, Ajax calls back out to a back end and, uh, and then rendering a page that way, you know, it was a, it was a bit more of a, of a, I'll pat, I'll pat my back, you pat my back and I'll pat yours, that, that kind of thing, uh, where you're just, you're trying to collaborate to get the project done. But uh, Jamstack and Headless has really kind of flipped that around and allowed everyone to focus on what they do best, but to a greater degree. So as a front end developer, you can focus much more on delivering that great user experience and having more control over the kinds of data that you have available to you and the kinds of, um, the kinds of services that you're going to be connecting with. Um, that was really one of the reasons why we decided that an API mesh should be a really interesting way to solve um, solve this issue of getting data from lots of different sources into a front end developer's hands. Um, there's a bunch of things that are, um, so what is an API mesh? There's a bunch of things that, that we see kind of uh, front end developers often struggling with. Uh, at the very bare minimum, one of those things is authentication. So just having to authenticate and then protect an API that, that from the front end that you may not necessarily have direct control over, is kind of a big deal for, for, uh, for someone. So in the old days, you might pass that through a proxy uh, on the back end that has some credentials in it. And then maybe it also is doing some um, some limiting down of the permissions that you have on that third party API. Um, one of the APIs that we connect with is Shopify and Shopify, once you connect to, to Shopify API with an API key, um, you've got access to that full API. If you wanna be able to use that API from somebody's front end, um, that becomes a security risk. And so you need to be able to permission that API correctly and lock that API, the permissions of that API down uh, much tighter so that you can actually use it from the front end. Um, so that's a that's a thing that's typically in the realm of a backend developer, but with an API mesh with something like Tchip, you can actually set up that authentication and authenticate to the and handle all the OAuth that you would that you would have to handle to communicate to the Shopify API. And then you can allow the API mesh to actually uh, restrict the permissions on that third party API for you so that what you get out the other end is just kind of the clean, um, safe version of the API that you can use from your front end. Um, so that that's a really powerful tool. It, it opens up a whole new avenue of, of development for, for a front end developer. The other side of that is, okay, if, not just one API I can, I can uh, improve for a front end developer. Now I can take a bunch of different APIs. Um, and we all kind of know this, I, this understand this problem when you're working in like a big API ecosystem where uh, concepts and objects may be spread across a bunch of different places. So let's just take an e-commerce, e-commerce will continue the Shopify example and we'll kind of do an e-commerce example. Say you've got the idea of a product. Um, well, you're, the idea of your product is contained in Shopify and maybe you're using Contentful for content and maybe you're using another system for personal, a personalization engine and you're using another system for order history um, and shipping information. All of these ideas of what a product is exists across all these different services. Um, so it would be great to get a consolidated view of a product so that when you say, give me uh, my, my product information, I can get information from the merchandising engine. So I can get information from Shopify. I can get information from my, my headless CMS. I can get information about my product from my personalization engine and enrich that, that product so I can do really interesting things on the front end with like a simple call to one API, not have to manage all those connections myself, uh, and then get back that rich object about my, about my product 
that's been enriched from all these different sources. Um, so that that's the other aspect of the, the meshing concept, which allows you to take data from a bunch of different sources and brings it, bring it together. Um, now that can work bi-directionally. So you can say, okay, now I want to query, but I also want to mutate data back in across all these places at once. Um, because we because the connection is bi-directional, um, you can you can actually have that ability. So you can update your product or update your customer record. Um, you know, you can make those updates in, in multiple places at once, which is which is pretty neat. Um, there's a bunch of other accept layers of what we think of as acceleration on top of the API mesh that we build. Um, so we do a bunch of stuff around caching and uh, retry logic. Um, and a new feature that we're coming out with soon is this API indexing feature. So you can actually index across um, the different APIs that you connect into, into TakeShape, which is going to be super powerful and kind of awesome. Um, so there's all these layers of, of enrichment that we, that we provide on top of the APIs that you connect into our platform. Um, and that's just all stuff that a front-end developer no longer has to think about. Uh, so if they don't have to worry about managing retries from the client um, or even from the static site generator or from a serverless function, that's pretty great. If they don't have to really worry too much about the permissions, permissioning APIs down and kind of locking them down, and we can provide that in a, in a straightforward UI, that's pretty great. Um, same thing with caching. We can make it really easy to provide, you know, caching rules on top of these other APIs. So if you have a really slow responding API it becomes super fast and you don't have to, to think too much about it. Um, all of these things on top of kind of the general um, goodness that is GraphQL in a lot of ways for a front-end developer, um, just really straightforward, very readable, um, highly declarative. So you, you see what you're gonna be getting back, which is great. And then there's just a ton of awesome tooling around GraphQL that when you tie everything together into a, a GraphQL mesh, you get that tooling for free. So you get, instant documentation of your APIs for free, um, as long as they're patched into the API mesh. Um, you get, uh, you know, code completion on your queries. Um, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty enabling. We see it as really being an enabler for front-end developers, um, not just the API meshes, but the, the concept of, of Jamstack in general and the concept of Headless in general. API mesh we see as being an architectural pattern to layer into the Jamstack and Headless. Yeah, I think this this is great. I think uh, definitely you, you put it in a really nice way uh, where, yes, we, we talk about a lot about headless and Jamstack and mm -hmm. what, what you put it out is something the pain with that to the front end developers. Like, especially you talked about authentication, like API tokens managing. Yes, I yeah. have a set of APIs. Okay, I now connect to my Jamstack. But how do I handle my API tokens? Uh, should I create a mm. serverless function to authentication? All the yeah. overhead we are talking about, I think uh, uh, this is great to see that uh, you're solving that pain and taking out the pain from the front-end developers uh, who, who are trying to build a Jamstack apps, uh, consuming the several set of uh, APIs. So uh, kind, of, kind of talking about uh, the new digital experience is not just only about content management. It could be e-commerce. It could mm -hmm. be uh, plugging uh, authentication with um, authentication or uh, plugging some payment system, Stripe. So how do you kind of uh, compose different set of uh, APIs to fit your business needs? And mm -hmm. so we kind of shifting responsibility to front end developers and you're trying to solve this burden of managing different APIs and the security in terms yep. of uh, the pain with that front end side and taking that burden off and this this is great. This is great. I, I, yeah. I want to switch. I want to switch back to more on an entrepreneur question to you. Uh, yeah, definitely. Like, what, what's what, what's the? I think um, this this was my second question when I when you talked about you started TakeShape as a GraphQL uh, a C, a CMS headless uh, for gra mm -hmm. using GraphQL. Like, what was your pivoting point? Uh, how did you observe that? Like, hey, uh, this is the area is a pain. Um, for our target developers, target focus is our front-end developers. This is the area we need to address them. Like this is the area we need to solve. Like when was your pivotal moment? Like what, how did you come up with that pivotal moment? Yeah, so about a year, maybe like six to eight months into having launched the product publicly. So it, 
you know, in the middle of 2019, in the in in kind of like the, you know, Q Q2 of 2019, we realized we were looking at what was going on in the market, and we were seeing, um, we were seeing kind of a lot of different headless CMS solutions pop up, um, and one of the things that we thought about was we were trying to think like in this space of, of headless of headless CMSs, what is what makes you actually competitive and useful? Um, and in the world of Jamstack that we're about to enter into, which is kind of this new, we saw it as being like a sea change in web development. Like something was about to happen that was going to radically change the way that people were gonna build on the web. Um, and we were gonna really make, have a pretty fundamental shift from like just client server to client API. And in that model of client API versus just client client server uh, connection, um, we what we saw was that there was gonna be a new set of problems. And so we, we realized that it wasn't gonna be immediate. Like this was not gonna be painful for most of the, of Jam, most of the people building on the Jamstack at that point in time. But we were trying to look ahead like, you know, two to three years to where things were going to be once the applications that people felt they were they could build on the Jamstack were more robust and full applications. Um, and the the problem that we understood that would arise from that was just the experience of dealing with APIs as a front end developer. And that was that was sort of the the realization that things like content management are just a node and just another API in, uh, in the constellation of APIs that you are interacting with as a developer. And they are, not, they are no longer the platform and on which you're building your application. So there's a, there's a common fallacy that, um, or not a common fallacy, but there, there is a historical precedent that was set by platforms like WordPress, um, uh, Adobe AEM, um, any of your enterprise content management platforms, because they had an actual server installation associated with them, you're building plugins and modules and packages, whatever your programming language and packaging system of choice is for that particular platform, that CMS became your app, almost like your application server in, in a lot of ways. Um, just think about if you're doing WordPress development and you're building plugins for WordPress, uh, everything becomes a plugin, um, and everything lives on on that server for the most part. Um, you may have other third party servers that you're talking to, and you're starting to get microservices at play in there. But that's already fundamentally shifting things over to an API model, and so the the core place where an application lives is no longer tied to that CMS. That's not that's no longer the critical piece of the application. Um, in an enterprise setting, this was the case for a, this was sort of the case for a while. They would have a CMS, and then they may have a middle tier layer where stuff from the CMS comes together, and stuff from different uh, services that the the enterprise provides comes together, and then they're generating a website like further down in their pipeline. Um, and so, in the enterprise space, this was fairly common, but also really clunky. It relied on back-end developers to build up these middleware layers that were talking to all of these different APIs that may be, you know, a SOAP API, or it may be like an XML API, you know, maybe at, at the best, it's now, a re, you know, it was a REST API back in the day. Um, but there's all this kind of uh, uh, kludginess that's going on to try to bring these disparate sources of information together and then push out a, a website that's going to be functional. That obviously creates a ton of um, a ton of hassle, and it really disempowers the the front end developer, which is really close to the user experience from uh, from creating being as creative as they want to be. Every front end, everybody's everybody in the, the engineering space and, and the development space is super creative, um, and so you want to empower front end developers to be as creative as they possibly possibly can be, so they can deliver like knockout you know, really stand out user experiences. Uh, and what we saw was this big holdup uh, around the, the legacy models that the Jamstack was about to like break down a bunch of walls. But the problem and the vacuum and the gap in that space was 
now that you've got a bunch of APIs and now that content is just a node and it's no longer the application server, where does your application come together? And for some people that answer was, well, it comes together in serverless functions and you know, like you're building, maybe that's the best case scenario. And what we realized was, hey, there's actually like a new kind of model that we can, we can push out into the world. There's like a new pattern here. And that pattern is this API like constellation, like, and, and the word API mesh just kind of like, I don't know, I don't actually remember where it came from, but we ba it basically just like popped into existence of, oh, it's a mesh of things. It's like, it's just a mesh of information. I think we probably made this hand gesture and then we just, it's an API mesh. And that's what, that's the thing that we, that's going to be missing from the Jamstack and missing from the headless world. Um, I think that, you know, that point has kind of been proven out uh, over time. And if, if you saw the recent Jamstack conference, uh, Matt Billman's keynote presentation, which was great, um, uh, the last couple slides in his keynote presentation talked about a GraphQL API layer and an API integration layer as being this next set of functionality that unlocks a bunch of capabilities in the, in the Jamstack and in the headless world of headless. And uh, I think that the time is currently you know, it now is the time that people are starting to feel that pain because they're building more complex things. It's no longer just people building out blogs with static site generators. It's now people building up full applications with frameworks like Next and frameworks like uh, like Astro. Um, you know, the, the, this is kind of like the future of how people will build. And so they need a place for their application to come together. And that place is inside of an API mesh, at least for us. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's great. Uh, uh, th that leads to my next question: Like, uh, what what trends are you seeing on our front end tooling side uh, to enhance this uh, developer experience? Uh, like already, you described the pain. Uh, yes, we are, everybody kind of sold out for Jamstack, but they yeah. have to deal with this API handling of this. Uh, do you see any kind of trends uh, on a front end? Uh, latest trends uh, which are trying to address this challenge or uh, can, can make the front-end tooling, uh, front-end developer experience better? Yeah, well, besides what I, besides the fact that I think API meshes will become critical um, to that future, I think that there's more on the tooling side and maybe more on like the low-level side. I think things like TypeScript have basically just be, become critical to, to building applications for the web. I think that, um, you know, that, that to me is like one of the most important shifts that, you know, the, the faster we switch to type languages on the front end, the better. Um, and I think the, you know, what Microsoft has done with, with TypeScript is great. And the fact that it's, it's taken hold and you see more, uh, more new NPM modules being created with TypeScript than JavaScript. Now, I think that that's, that's a great, um, that's a great trend and, and that's a great shift. Um, you know, I think you know, the, I think kind of the the thing that I think gets it is kind of exciting around um, you know around tooling is like a little bit of the stand like again like low level stuff like you know Visual Studio Code I think is like great the fact that code spaces exist I think is a really neat thing um, it means that more people can get involved with the coding process um, and I think that's really cool um, you know I think that the Git workflow being very ingrained in people at this point is a really, um, that's a huge strength. Uh, you know, just the fact that people feel like they have, um, you know, they have a place to kind of, they have, a, they have an understanding in a way of building um, in a workflow around building, I think is really, really uh, important. Um, you know, specific tooling, I think, uh, kind of comes and goes depending on you know, what, what happens to be fashionable at, at, at a particular time. Um, but I think some of those like core ideas around like type languages are really, really, really valuable. Um, you know, that, that's the stuff that will, that will be more permanent than any one particular, particular mm -hmm. tool of like talking about Webpack or, you know, something like that. I think on the SSG side of things, I think things like Next and Astro are pretty exciting. You know, I think those are, those are cool. Those are really interesting, um, frameworks. I think Astro is like the thing that I, you know, I, I hear more about now than, than anything else. And I think that they, they have a really interesting model. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the things that will, the things that will last are the architectures and like the architectural patterns. Like those are the things that I think have real staying power. 
versus any one particular library or framework. Um, I think that the architectural patterns are what, uh, what, will, what will last longer. Um, and we're hoping that API meshes are an architectural pattern that will that we'll see that that kind of pick up and and, la and last the test of time. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree that Astro is getting popularity, and I have a thinking about having less JavaScript um, on the mm -hmm. client side, delivering what really matters. Uh, if it's for static sites like a blog, which is not a website portfolio website, it has not changing frequently. It doesn't have a dynamic content much dynamic content. So it makes sense to think about shipping less JavaScript. Um, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's, that's, that's great. And uh, what about like, I think some of the points you talked about is um, making it easier, uh, kind of tooling side, uh, are you also considering about uh, low code, uh, low code, uh, or no code patterns, like, hey, uh, we want to attract more uh, mm -hmm. non tech people also handle the get their job done. Uh, they don't have to be completely technical engineers to get uh, the API mesh done. Are we also, also considering the, the trend yeah. which is going on low code, no code platforms where uh, even the non-technical people can get their job done. Like for example, Zapier or uh, others, yeah. like just connect them. So you get your API key, just connect it and try to uh, bring it. Uh, can, can you tell us about like, what's, what's, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, low code and no code, I think are both, I, I would consider what we're doing with um, with Take Shape as being kind of a low code solution. Um, you know, we provide, we, we the platform is really designed to do two things. It's designed to abstract, be kind of an abstraction layer, but maybe more importantly, uh, be like a, a, a layer to navigate complexity um, because you have a, you're building a constellation of, of APIs that you're using. Um, which introduces a lot of complexity in your potential, potentially introduces a lot of complexity in your application. Um, and there's going to be errors and failures. And, um, you know, you want to be able to surface that complexity to a developer so that they can understand it. Um, and so when we think about our platform, there's really two, we think about development at development skill as a continuum uh, going from, you know, your very junior developer that feels maybe more comfortable looking at things inside of a GUI um, and then exploring, exploring text, like te exploring code and things in text files uh, with the assistance of, of some kind of GUI interface um, all the way to somebody who just wants to look at the, you know, just wants to look at the code and feels really comfortable looking at code dealing straight in their IDE and then using a CLI to push things up. And so we've tried to adopt both um, personas for the for our tooling. Um, so when we think about Take Shape, it has an easy to use graphical interface and it has a powerful uh, you know, way to inject schemas, which everything from the UI boils down into a schema. Um, so it has a UI that makes it easy to generate a schema. And then it has the ability to uh, push up raw schemas really easily into the platform, whether it's from your local IDE or it's from a CI environment. Um, we, we're trying to be able to uh, cater to, you know, to the full continuum of developer experience. So in that way, we see it as being kind of a low code solution where if, if you are just getting into the idea of front end development, we want you to be able to understand the architectural model of an API mesh and build a GraphQL API without ever actually having to know anything about GraphQL on the back end. You know, one of the things that gets people freaked out about GraphQL is they, they think it's complicated. And what we've tried to do with our platform is really boil it down to the hardest thing about GraphQL on our platform should be uh, for the novice user should be that they have to write a query. Like that should be the hardest thing. And we put tooling in place to make sure that even that is really easy. So using, you know, GraphQL tools, you get, uh, you know, the, the graphical explorer, you basically get, you know, code completion on a GraphQL query and you get that inside of, uh, you know, the, the graphical explorer that's on the web um, in our web application. And then if you're a more advanced user and you want to pull down your, sch your schema and you want to do, write queries locally on your local IDE environment, you can do that and get the same code completion on your local environment. Um, 
you know, if you want to craft your uh, your schema by hand in your local environment and then push it up to take shape through our CLI tool, you can totally do that. And we publish a JSON schema so that you can configure your local IDE to have uh, you know, validation of, of the schema file that you're creating. Um, so you know, we're trying to create a really smooth developer experience um, for you know, kind of across the, across the board there. That's great, that's great. Um... How do you like, it's a developer focused product. So I'm always curious to hear, how do you uh, keep getting the feedback from uh, your users uh, so that you keep making the product uh, yeah. smoother or easier to use? Um, uh, so can, can you tell us a little bit about like, how do you keep making your developer experience great for your product? Yeah, so we constantly talk about developer experience. That's the first thing that, that we do. So we're always reflecting on changes to the product about whether or not they improve uh, develop DevX. That's the, the, you know, the term that we use internally for it. Um, so we constantly talk about DevX as being something that we're trying to improve. And that comes from both sides, right? It comes from the, is the API doing what it needs to do? Uh, is the IDE tooling also coming up at the same time? Is our documentation coming up at the same time as our API is coming up so that, you know, the documentation is being updated and maintained and uh, kind of continually improved? Um, and are we talking to, to users all the time? So talking to users all the time is, I think, the, one of the most important things that you can do with the product, um, especially a developer product. And so we do that in a couple of different ways. We have a live chat feature inside of our product. So a, develop, a developer can open up a live chat and start talking to us at any point in time. And you'll talk to a member of the engineering team when you're, when you're talking to somebody on, on the platform. Um, we do that, which has been great. That's awesome because we can get a really good understanding by talking directly to you through the application of what kind of problem you're having, you know, what you're looking to do, and you always have a channel open to, to talk to us. We also have a Slack community where that similar thing happens. Um, where we work with customers inside the Slack community in, in a very similar fashion. Um, and then for a customer, for our larger customers, we tend to do shared Slack channels with them. And so we get a lot of feedback from people uh, just by talking to them. Uh, and then we take that feedback and we, we try to incorporate it into the application. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the way that we continually improve the product is by having a really smooth um, engineering process. So when, you know, literally just like when things come into our shortcut, you know, formerly Clubhouse, you know, we're processing those items, we're pointing them as a team, we're discussing them, and then they're going into the, the backlog to be worked on and prioritized. Um, and then we are really like the time to uh, you know, the time between your cycle time is like a thing that we keep an eye on. Um, and we're trying to always, we're trying to constantly release. So we release the product multiple times a day. Um, and we have tooling in place to make it easy to release the product multiple times a day. And so there's some DevOps things that we do on our end um, to make sure that we can, we constantly feel comfortable releasing the product. Um, there's a bunch of layers of testing that we have in place that makes us confident to, to test the product. Um, so there's a ton of automated testing that we do and Cypress, we do Cypress unit testing and integration testing and Cypress testing so that by the time something gets to a code review, it's already been validated that it's not going to <laughs> break everything. Um, and then you're doing code review and then you're doing uh, you know, you're doing your, your acceptance test and then, and then you can release the, the feature. Um, and so we try to make that cycle as, as fast as possible. And then we usually close the loop with that user and just ping them directly. Uh, and we will tell somebody who'd either suggested a feature or reported a bug that, hey, this has been resolved and, you know, please check it out. And then, you know, that, that ends up being a great way to inspire people to provide additional feedback. That's great. Uh, that's great. Do you have any kind of KPI to kind of measure your success? Like, hey, we released this feature. So this was kind of more effective. Uh, we saw this results. Do you have any, any work with any KPIs? Um, 
around just around like the engineering performance, it's mainly that like cycle time KPI. Um, but you know, uh, are you maybe asking like how often like are people using the feature and like going back and and examining it? Yeah, it's more like uh, you're going to invest some time to build that feature requested by the customer because that's where the pain point. And yeah. do you measure your success? Like your engineering team might have spent two sprints of their effort to build that feature. Uh, yeah. Was it really worth worth building it? Like, uh, do you get enough? Like, hey, we saw an increase in maybe the usage of that particular feature because we shipped that feature. Um, yeah. So you see it's successful, like we made a good bet and it, we were successful on uh, with that usage. So it was it was a win-win for everybody. And we see we made a successful bet yeah, I I agree with you. That's a great way to do it. Um, we're not. I wouldn't say we're sophisticated enough to go back and and check and look at our KPIs again. We actually collect all the data, um, but we don't typically go back and and validate like this thing that we spent time on. Uh, uh, you know, ended up being worth that. You know, two days that it took to do, or five minutes that it took to do. Um, the thing that we the thing that validates it for us is if we see people like asking questions about it and and then using it and so that's the thing that that validates it for us um we also typically send out change log emails uh and then we have we use like uh you know we have search in our docs and so if we see people searching for things or we see people um you know clicking on links in our change log emails to that are going to a specific thing, feature that we just released that it's pointing to a docs link or something like that. That's the kind of information that we collect. Um, and then you quickly know if people are encountering the feature because they're, uh, they're asking questions about it. And so, yeah, we collect, we collect the data, but we don't, we don't go back and, and check right now, but we should, but we don't. Oh, uh, yeah. And also I think you, you mentioned it's, it's also not straightforward. Like, uh, whereas in e-commerce, like you see a checkout, like this, how it uh, this how it started from landing page to the checkout. Mm -hmm. This how it took, and we made optimize for the developer experience. Uh, it's 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 hard to think in the same angle. Um, I think we have to look in a different perspectives. Um, yeah. Um, what what are, what are cool. some of the products? Uh, what are some of the products where you are inspired by the great developer experience? Do you have any examples? Like, hey, these are some of the things I really inspired. Uh, it could be documentation, it could be API, um, some of the things you, which inspired those uh, developer focused products. Yeah, I've been, um, I've been really inspired by like Netlify is, is obviously very inspiring in what they do with, with uh, developer experience. You know, I think they've, they've figured that out and done a really great job of that. Um, you know, that that's on the, the Jamstack side of things. I think Netlify does a great job. I think, um, you know, Contentful has, I've seen Contentful do a really good job of this as well. Um, you know, there's been, I think a lot of, anybody that's doing a lot of communicating with the community, I think is is usually doing a, a, a really, um, really, usually doing really excellent work. Folks that have put a lot of time into their documentation, um, I think I, I credit Gatsby with a lot of with a lot of effort on the documentation side of things. I think documentation and education is like so critical in, in the developer experience to, to to like improving developer experience. Um, I think those things are just, you know, just kind of essential. Um, you know, any kind of community that is really growing. I have a lot of respect for programming language communities that are growing. Um, you know, I've been, for some reason, I've just been very interested lately in like more programming language history and, uh, and like early history of um, computer, uh, I guess like computer hardware engineering. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've been getting very interested in the history of um, Next as a company. And if, if people, if anybody remember that, that's an old company that people might not not know. But uh, Next is the you know Steve Jobs company after he left Apple and before he came back to Apple. Um, you know, so I've been very I've been very interested in just researching um, that kind of stuff lately. And there's something about um, the lo like low level programming languages that I think there's a, a lot of really interesting developer experience around that, that you wouldn't necessarily think of as developer experience, but for a programming language to be really popular, like it has to have, there has to be a community built up around it that's really responsive. There has to be really good documentation around it. There has to be a lot of good stuff around, um, around the educational piece. 
And so if you look at things like Rust, you know, that, that the community built around that is, is really strong and they have a really good educational path for people. Um, when you look at, uh, when you look at, I, I, I have a niece, I have nieces and nephews that are starting to get to the age where they can use a computer and I want to start getting them into programming. Um, and so when you look at just even things that are being done for, for children about getting them into programming, um, you know, things like Scratch uh, as, as a, as a, as an environment is a really interesting thing to look at um, because it provides that educational piece to like, it, and it really provides an educational piece. So I think those things, th those kind of things are fascinating. Um, there's also like uh, hacker communities that are doing really interesting things. Um, there was one I came across the other day uh, and I'm blanking on the name of it, but there, but it's a, it's a Pico CTL. CFL, Pico CFL, or Pico CTL, um, they're doing an entire, you know, they, they, they're trying to create a pipeline of, um, of hackers, probably, you know, for the, for enterprises that are worried about cybersecurity uh, and the government mm -hmm. that's worried about cybersecurity. And so they're trying to create an entire pipeline of people that understand these very complex topics and the way that they, the way that they, onboard them into this world of, of becoming a hacker is like fascinating to me. It's, it's all education based through game, like by gamification. And it's very fascinating. It's, um, oh yeah. Cap, yeah. It's Pico CTS. So uh, Pico capture the flag. Yeah. That's, that's what it's called. Um, but that, that community is fascinating. It's designed for high school students and below. Um, but they have an amazing set of educational materials that I think are just really, really interesting and the way that they bring you up to speed is really interesting so pr pretty that, that that kind of stuff is pretty cool it's not your traditional developer experience stuff but it it uh it shows you like i think a lot about a lot of what goes on in the, develop, the developer world is self-education and you know it, it's uh a lot of it is autodidactic and so like it's tons of autodidactic learning and a lot of times you have to try to build systems that are uh are geared around that, and and I think that there's a lot of work that we can that we can do there, um, and I think the companies that identify that and build build uh, their developer experience around that, I think, especially when it's when it's new concepts and new new patterns that you have to learn are are gonna gonna do really well. So I think like stuff like the Jamstack Explorer stuff that Netlify does is a great example of that, where you can. You know, it's a learning pipeline that you go at your own pace and, and pick things up. I think that's a, a great way to get people into the into an, a community. Um, and then documentation is just like super critical on the other end. And once you're once you're an expert and you're learning and you feel comfortable reading docs or looking at source code, you know, that element of developer experience becomes really important. So developer experience is like so multifaceted, everything from, you know, it really is like a there's a funnel type experience and you have multiple kinds of personas that are coming in at different levels of your product um, and in order to have a really healthy product in the developer tool space you really have to appeal to to different kinds of developers that have different degrees of, of knowledge and education and so it's uh it's a it's a really big challenge it's got to be one of the hardest um Developer market, they say like developer marketing doesn't exist and it's really all this experiential experiential piece. And I think that's super true because it's mainly about like how, how, how much tooling can you put in place and how much structure can you put in place for people so that they can learn this thing and feel comfortable with the, the thing that you're building. So I think that it's, um, it's a really interesting area of, uh, it's a, it's a really like developer experience in general. It's just, it's, it's a fascinating problem to solve. Yeah, I think that's ton, ton of, ton of very, very, very interesting resources you shared. Uh, do, do you have any kind of uh, resources or blogs or authors uh, you recommend following uh, just to keep up to date with the developer experience or Jamstack, Headless? Uh, do, you, do you follow any specific one you would like to recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, the way that I do my information, like consume information is um, like a smattering from a bunch of different sources. So I subscribe to a bunch of different topics on Medium and I don't even remember the names of all the publications, but 
uh, I just will subscribe to topics in general and then get a nice little um, uh, digest in my inbox every morning and, and take a peek at that. I pay attention to the Pointer newsletter, which is a digest of Hacker News. Um, and then I pay attention to Hacker News all the time um, about what's going on there. Uh, and then for like specific for like headless information uh, and Jamstack information, I usually pay pretty close attention to what uh, Netlify is talking about. I'll pay close attention to what Brian Rinaldi is talking about. Um, you know, those are those are a couple of the sources that I usually I poke in and, and check out. Jason Langsdorf, I, I, I try I follow him on on Twitter and I try to pay attention to what he's he's talking about. Um, you know, he I recently saw some of the work that he was doing comparing Astro and Next.js and found that really fascinating. Um, so being somebody who's running, you know, being somebody who's running a company, I have to try to get my news in these little these little bits and bobs and 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 pick it up from a bunch of different different sources. But I try to stay up to date about what's going on in the development space. And then I try to poke my head up above that and see what's going on in the meta like uh, like business environment around the the development space. So like what's happening in dev tools in general, what's happening in in the way that enterprises are thinking about building and how are they building and what are they investing in. Um, honestly, I, I try to read uh, Har uh, the Harvard Business Review every day and you know just catch up on whatever article that, that they're talking about. I think it's important to when you're when you're doing development work. Or building things for developers, I think it's important to not just um, be totally consumed with uh, developer news all the time, but like poke your head up up every once in a while and see what else is going on um, in like the broader space uh, that you might be in, just to just to make sure that like what's going on in development world is jiving with what's going on in in uh, in in the rest of the world. That's great. That's great. Uh... Any, any final advice you would like to give uh, for products, um, developer-focused products, uh, teams who are trying to build a great product for developers? Uh, any, any final piece of advice you'd like to give from your experience? Yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest thing that I can, the biggest advice that I can say, I can share is like ship and then be prepared for feedback and be prepared to integrate. And that process, can never stop. So it's ship and feedback, ship and feedback, ship and feedback. Um, and if you're not talking to people, if you're not talking to people about what you're shipping or what you just shipped or what you intend to ship and getting their thoughts on it, then, then you're going to fall behind. You can't have um, some of the biggest mistakes that we've made in product development have been periods of time where we waited to ship until something was perfect instead of shipping it early, getting feedback on it, validating it, and then and then incorporating that feedback and then constantly shipping. If people feel bought into your into the development of the product and the development of um, the technology, then then you'll create more a more loyal following and you'll your product will be much better off for it because you'll have you'll be getting great feedback and and it'll help you uh, focus in on what's really important. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's a really great feedback, and I can totally agree with you. The importance of the continuous feedback loop. So we build a right product, and we understand uh, the pulse of the customer or the user. Um, yeah, I think it was really great, uh, great Mark, and I really enjoyed talking with you. And uh, thank you very much.